Uh, without further ado, please welcome Mr. Frank Cole from Elevator Agency. Where's my uh, clicker? Brad, do you take my clicker? Is it over here? Green one, right? Yep. All right, guys. Hey, thanks for having me. Let's give it up one more time for Bob, Bo, Brad. Let's get a round of applause, please. <laughs> These guys have done such an amazing job, and I think you're going to notice a theme. Does anybody notice a theme going on so far about standardizing, productizing, taking control of your agency and eliminating chaos? Well, I'm going to continue that theme because that's really what my uh, presentation is about today. Before we get started, I want you guys to connect with me. Uh, I, I would really love to hear from you guys. So I've got my uh, Twitter handle there, which I'm not really on Twitter that much, but you can go ahead and tweet at me. Uh, visit my website or shoot me an email. I'd really prefer that you shoot me an email. Also, on all the other socials, I think I'm at Frank Cowell, like Instagram and whatever the cool kids are doing. I'm not on Snapchat because I don't understand it. So connect with me, please. Uh, so a little bit about my agency, as uh, Marcus mentioned, San Diego, but more specifically in Carlsbad. Anybody been to Carlsbad? Anybody? Yeah, OK, someone's clapping over there. Awesome. So I'd encourage you guys, if you're ever in Carlsbad, please email me and come by and see me. Uh, this is outside of our office here in downtown Carlsbad Village. Uh, if you're in for a great drink, we keep a fully stocked bar. So if that's any incentive, come on by. We'd love to have you there. Before I get started, I want to give a word of caution. You've already heard this from a few people today, but I don't want you to break what's already working. Like, don't let me be the guy that screws things up for you, right? Don't go back and implement some things just because you heard me say it in a presentation and then realize uh, I, this isn't working for me and I, damn it, I shouldn't have listened to that guy. Uh, so don't break what's already working. I believe uh, this is called the Hippocratic Oath, right? And I know Ryan does this a lot talks about don't break what is already working. So what I want to talk to you today about is an approach for taking control of the agency sales process. Uh, because many, for many, many years, I, I actually got it really wrong, and we're going to talk about that today. And the reason that you want to take control of the agency sales process, you want to accomplish a few things that I find to be very important when selling professional services. One is to establish authority. We've talked a lot about building that trust with clients, but if you don't have it and you don't have the, the role of authority, selling what we have to offer, guys, in my opinion, is very, very difficult. Anybody else agree with that? If you don't have that position of authority, selling what you're selling is very difficult because now you're just getting compared to every other joker that does what we do, right? And if, in case you haven't noticed, the number of digital marketing agencies and people are cropping up like they're coming out of the woodwork every day. It's like the new business to start. Got nothing better to do? You got a laptop? Start a digital marketing agency. Uh, in San Diego specifically, anybody who's been in that market, there are so many of us. It's, I sometimes go, oh my god, I drive home sometimes. I'll pull over. There's like a hot dog stand, and I just kind of drool at that hot dog stand because, man, that's such a simple business. Anybody ever kind of look at other business models and kind of be envious and jealous? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of us out there. So you have to figure out how to establish authority, and that's what you know, I want to talk about today. I also want to help you eliminate ambiguity in the sales process. Ambiguity. In other words, I don't want you guys selling just anything. I want you to sell a very specific something, and I want you to know what that specific something is and know it so well and be so damn good at it that you start to build that authority and positioning even further. And I also want to help you differentiate your brand along the way. So again, a moment ago, I talked about how many of there, there are out in the marketplace. Too many, right? Uh, so how do you differentiate in a sea of digital marketers that are knocking on our clients and prospects' doors? How do you differentiate? If you take control of the sales process, I promise you this is one of the by byproducts you'll get. Ultimately, what we want to have happen, what I want to have happen, pardon me, is I want to win more of the right business. Anybody in here fed up with having too much of the wrong business? Is that just me? Right, because I spent a lot of time having too much of the wrong business. So what is the, what is the right business? So in my opinion, it's this. It's clients who buy into your way. Clients who come on board and they trust you right from the get-go. Right from the get-go. Anybody, 
Anybody ever have a client send you on so many revisions and so many rabbit holes that you just want to shoot yourself by the time this thing's done? I remember one time we had, and shame on us, by the way, shame on us. I remember one time we had a client, CEO, no doubt, of a publicly traded company, want to go through like 18, 19, 20 revisions of the slider on a home page. And again, shame on us for allowing that, but I got to tell you, when you go through 18, 19 revisions on anything, nobody's winning, right? Nobody's winning. So I want clients who, who buy into my way right from the get-go because they're going to let you lead. They're going to see you as the leader, and they're going to trust you. You know, Brad talked about this just a moment ago, and I loved what he put on the screen. Uh, in fact, I'm going to talk to you a bit more about that, Brad, if you're still in the room. Uh, but that balance between... Uh, you know, not being their savior, but not just, you know, handing it over to them. What, what's that middle ground like? Uh, but letting you lead, letting you be the coach. And that starts in the sales process, guys. It starts right from the beginning. And I want you to, uh, through this, be, be able to get the clients that need the thing you're great at. The thing you're great at. Not just anything you can do, but the thing you're actually great at. So before we jump into that and we talk about how you make that happen, just show of hands, who wants that? Who wants that in their sales process, right? That's kind of a redundant question. Of course, everybody wants that, but I had to put that in there. Um, and before I tell you about um, how to go about doing that, let me tell you about how I spent years getting it wrong. Because I don't stand up here today to tell you that I'm this guru who's got everything figured out and shit just runs amazing. I never have any problems. I do have some very positive byproducts of doing this in my agency, though, which I'll talk about in a moment. But uh, this only came about because I spent so many years getting it wrong and so many years uh, running a business that I just wasn't fully happy with. So in the beginning, I started out at my kitchen table with a laptop. I was building websites for people and, and any other form of digital that would be related to the website. And slowly that morphed into... Uh, doing branding work, and then we would do commercial quality videos, and we got to a point where we were a full-service creative agency, working on very big branding projects, big heavy-lifting web projects. We were pretty good at it, but one of the things that we weren't great at is understanding where our next food was coming from. Anybody resonate with that? Not knowing where that next set of work was going to come from, we were always having to go out and kill the next thing so we can keep the pipeline full. And as a result of our expansion into more and more services, we were selling anything and everything, by the way. Like I said, we had one client one time who wanted to launch a campaign to promote a new product, and they just mentioned the word video. They just mentioned the word video, and I was, we can do that. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's do a video. Now, mind you, I'd never done a video in my life, right? At least not uh, ones that I could show publicly. Um, never did a video in my life. Now, fortunately, that worked really well, but when I brought these kinds of things back to my team, my team would always be like, what the hell are you doing? Like, we don't do video. Well, yeah, we do. I just sold it. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, what if we screw this up? Don't worry. I charged them way too much, so that way if we do screw it up, they're never going to know. We're just going to keep throwing money at it, right? And that was kind of how I approached it, right? Like, if I'm going to figure out how to sell something new, we'll just make sure we're making the right margin on it. We're a premium uh, kind of agency, and so there you go. We were selling anything and everything, but no predictability in the business. Um, and I talked about this. Everything was kind of custom services, right? And th the thing I found is I, I was the company's best asset when it came to sales, but I was also the company's biggest hindrance because I, I had all this experience where I could go into a, a room and I could sit with the, in the boardroom with the CEO and they could tell me about all their problems. They could just cry their hearts out to me and how uh, things weren't working and the business problems they need to solve. And I was really good, guys. Like, I could dissect anything on the spot. Boom, boom, boom. Let's come up with a plan. Let's do this. And so I'd walk back to my agency with this custom plan every single time. And that created a lot of chaos. As a result, we got to a place where we were pretty successful, pretty well known. Um, we were growing. But we weren't successful in the ways that mattered to me as the owner, right? And surely there was not the kind of profitability I wanted. And certainly there wasn't the kind of predictability that I wanted. And there wasn't the kind of sanity 
that I wanted. So what I'm going to talk to you today about, guys, is really about creating more sanity and control in your agency. Right? As, as Ryan mentioned earlier, yes, you can scale, but for me, the driving force behind doing what I do with this kind of approach is to create more sanity for myself because I realized I just couldn't do it anymore. I just didn't want it. As a result, this year, I, I told myself when I reached 10 years in business, I wanted to take a one-month sabbatical. I'd never done that. Year 10 came, and guess who could not take his sabbatical? This guy. Year 11 came. Guess who still couldn't take the sabbatical? And this was kind of like a, a treat, a gift I wanted to give myself for just having made it, right? Like just to make it in business that long is kind of an accomplishment. I knew that and I wanted to celebrate it. Year 12 came by. Well, in year 12, I said, okay, next year, no matter what, I don't care what the F is happening in my business, this is happening. Along that time is when I was on this journey, by the way. Well, I'm proud to say I was able to take my one month sabbatical. And as a result of running the agency in this manner and thinking this way about the agency, where it's not all dependent upon Frank, I deleted email from my phone. I deleted the calendar from my phone. I deleted Slack. I deleted everything. Literally, like I could not get company email on my phone. Went away for 30 days, came back, hit select all on the email, delete. Damn, that felt good. Damn, that felt good. So this, this to me is a little bit of a testament as to the kind of architecting that I've been working on and that I want to talk about today and the kind of control you can put back in your lives. Who wants that? Anybody want that? Right? Yes? OK, let's talk about it. Um, a couple of other problems, though, that I had along the way was I also hired a lot of salespeople along the way that just didn't work out. Anybody hire salespeople and have mixed results? Quite a few of you, right? Um, I was always having these mixed results because well, at first, I had no idea why, right? Because I thought they were good, and at first, they'd come out the gate hot, and they'd sell something. And I was like, yes, finally. This isn't just dependent upon me. But then somewhere along the way, they would just hit a lull, and then, like, shit wouldn't happen. And so things just weren't working out. And I realized, again, that's because I was expecting people to sell the way I sell. Just go into a room with a blank piece of paper and just go sell marketing, right? Go sell marketing. Folks, if you're going to hire salespeople and you don't have this stuff really defined, you're not setting them up for success. And this is what I was doing. I was not setting people up for success at all. And so I ran through a number of salespeople along the way. And that wasn't fun. Anybody ever happen to let anyone go? Probably a lot of you in here. Is it fun? No way in hell, right? No way. Uh, so definitely not fun. And I got to a point where I said, damn it, I'm mad as hell. I'm just not going to take it anymore. I have to do something. I have to fix this because this is not what I signed up for. Right? When I ventured into this, I thought, I'm the man. We're going to do this. We're going to grow this thing. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have this amazing business. We're going to make money. This is going to be fantastic. And then somewhere along the way, it just became like a job that I didn't like. So I did some soul searching. Myself and my business partner, we did some soul searching. And we just had to like dig in and find out what's wrong here. What's the answer? What do we want? And after talking to a lot of other agencies, I had to get vulnerable, by the way, guys. I had to be really vulnerable and just go to peers, people just like you. And I had to admit, like, I don't really know what I'm doing. Like, I got a lot of kudos and a lot of accolades in the marketplace because we grew our agency to seven figures on the previous model. But I still didn't feel like I knew what I was doing. And it took getting to a place of being very vulnerable to ask other people, like, I, I don't know what I'm doing if I'm going to move forward. And I found, in talking to a lot of other agencies, that all agencies are just chaotic and inefficient. I mean, this is a messy, messy business, right? In fact, we'll have people that come in and they'll, uh, they'll talk about how other agencies run, and I'm like, agencies are a mess, right? We're just, it's just a messy business. I also found that many of us are trying to be jack of all trades and master of none. That's what I found, is we weren't alone in that. We weren't alone. Ultimately, we were yesing ourselves into unpredictability, inefficiency, and unhappiness. I have anybody ever heard the talk that Ryan does about the 12-stacker cheeseburger? Anybody ever see that? He talks about how like, you can look at this big, juicy cheeseburger, and it just looks so delicious. And that is a, uh, uh, 
what's the word, a, a metaphor or analogy for opportunity, right? And what happens is when we say yes to opportunity, because we're taught opportunity is a good thing, we end up getting full on this cheeseburger and end up getting sick because we end up overindulging. And essentially that's what we were doing is we were overindulging. We were saying yes to everything. We were yesing ourselves into a terrible, terrible place. And so at the end of the day, instead of going home and feeling like rock stars, right? Instead of going home and feeling amazing about what we do, we end up going home and feeling like this, right? This is like, look like, a, like you just survived a tornado, right? Like you just survived a tornado. Sometimes you just feel like this, right? I know I did. By the way, I'm embarrassed to admit this. This is my son. This is, guys, I don't think you understand how embarrassing this is. The other night, we're in the house, and wife and I are sit, sitting down, and the kid's playing, and he has a little toy room, a playroom, and we hear, like, this, like, demolition going on, like, destruction. And we look at each other like, what the hell is going on? We walk over there, and I find this, and he's just laying there chilling out after he went through this, like, destruction. Now, if you notice, there's actually, like, a little toy chest thing that's ripped, he like, anyways, so this is, what, <laughs> this is what we end up feeling like at the end of the day. Like we're just in the middle of a tornado and we're just getting hit from all sides and it certainly isn't the paradise that we had thought it was going to be. So we found a better way. And we'll talk about what finding a better way means. The goal for finding a better way was to create a consistent and logical process, selling a highly valuable offering that doesn't require Frank to sell it. That was the goal. We had to architect this so it didn't require me to sell it. Because if I was going to build something that required me to sell it, then I was only creating a job for myself. Now, I'm not here to say this should be your goal, guys. This is simply my goal, right? Because I'm, I'm looking to be more and more out of direct client communication relationships. That's just my personal goal, right? I want to continue to build a team where they can sell, deliver, support, and make customers successful. So this was my goal. That was finding a better way for me. So one of the things we had to, we had to do a few things along this journey. So we had to stop selling anything and everything. We just had to stop. So when I started my agency, again, I, I mentioned we started out doing custom content managed, backed, big websites, branding, et cetera, et cetera. We literally got rid of all that. We just scaled it back, scaled it all back, the, the offering, uh, to where our only service offering is inbound marketing. We won't do your websites anymore. I won't do your commercial quality videos. So we had to decide and pick our poison, so to speak. We had to pick where we were going to specialize and what we were going to fall in love with and just own. Which means we also had to standardize our offering. So one of the challenges I had when I first started selling inbound marketing, which is just another uh, word for uh, uh, digital or driving uh, content and funnels, uh, right? Um, as you know, in there, there's a lot of things you could be doing, right? You could be blogging, you could be developing lead magnets and landing pages, CTAs, you could be doing paid ads, you could be doing all this stuff, right? So when I first started selling that, I still got it wrong because it was more so like all of these things are up and on the table is for defining your solution. But we had to standardize our offering so that way we aligned it around the client need. So if the need after our discovery and after our analysis was that they needed more opportunities for lead conversion, well then we had a very specific way we went about generating leads on a website. And it included some very specific things. Does that make sense? So then what we were not doing any longer is sitting down with a blank sh sheet of paper and saying, okay, for this client, how should we generate leads? For this client, how should we generate traffic? For this client, how should we nurture those leads once they're in the database? We stopped doing that. And what we did is we came up with a way that that's done. Which meant we also had to standardize our sales process. Because if we were going to, if we were going to deliver that way, we had to sell that way and set the, the expectation right up front. And we also had to focus on outcomes. You've been hearing a lot about that, but that to me is huge. Focus on outcomes. In other words, what is the outcome that your client is ultimately looking for? I will tell you, if you get a client that comes to you and their first request is, I need someone to do my blogging. 
I need someone to do my website. I'm not saying you can't service those people, but already you're starting off with somebody who's looking for hands, not your brain. So one of the things I want to encourage you guys to do, and there's no specific action item here, but I want you to start thinking about in what cases are you simply selling hands versus selling a solution, versus selling a way that you do things. And I apologize, uh, getting over a cold. Nobody saw that. Thank you. And this, is be this has become a rally cry for me. We had to stop solving every client's individual little problem and instead solve the big problem. And by the big problem, I mean what is the common problem for the audience you serve? If you specialize in running traffic through paid media, what is the outcome they're looking for? What is the problem you're solving and for who? And what's your formula for getting that done consistently? And that's just not to suggest that it's a 100% cookie cutter, but it's a far cry from custom services and reinventing the wheel each time. It, this is my belief right here, and the reason I believe this works, and I've proven that it does work. I believe this works because if businesses simply just executed the hell out of a good plan, they would experience radical success. How many times do you have clients come to you and you meet a VP of marketing, let's say, and you start inquiring and interviewing with this VP of marketing and you find out that they're just simply not doing the things that a VP of marketing should be doing? Anybody appalled at the state of corporate marketing in America right now or anywhere for that matter? Anybody, appalled, anybody ever ask yourself, how the hell do they still have a job as vice president of marketing? when they're not even doing the things that a vice president of marketing should do. I'm blown away all the time at vice presidents of marketing that don't know their CPLs, they don't know their COCAs, they don't know the important metrics of their business. They have no idea who their buyer personas are. I'm blown away all the time at the lack of work actually being done in these businesses. So in my opinion, if they follow my plan and we execute the hell out of my plan, we're gonna do a lot better than what they've been doing because they haven't been following a plan. Am I right, guys? Right? They haven't been following a plan. They haven't been doing what they're supposed to be doing. So in my opinion, we don't need to solve every client's individual little problem and come up with a custom plan for every single client. You apply your plan in a tailored fashion and execute the hell out of that. Execute it better than they've ever executed marketing, ever. Now the flip side of this is you have to deliver the goods. Your way, your plan has to be proven to generate results, right? That's the flip side, right? You can't, you can't take control this way unless you've proven your worth, unless you know it works. So let's talk about a few ways of what, how you might implement something like this in your business. You guys have seen uh, several examples here today. I loved Bo's visual example. Uh, Brad did some amazing things on the whiteboard here. So you guys have already picking up some ideas on this. But the first thing I want you to do is figure out what you're really selling, what big problem are you solving? So Brad asked a moment ago who here sells websites, and I would ask you if you sell websites, what problem does that website solve? And I would encourage you to really rethink if you're in the website business. Or if you sell traffic, what are you really solving for? And the other component to this is who are you solving it for? What's the problem and who are you solving it for? Because you have to start focusing on outcomes and you have to start focusing on how your journey that you've developed over all the years of experience that you guys have is a proven way to get there, right? You can start putting that in the marketplace. You can start selling that and get more of that authority and leadership. Here's an example. Uh, what if the problem was you deal with software companies are not getting enough qualified leads? That's the problem, right? The problem wasn't, I need new landing pages, right? If that company came to you and said, yeah, I'm looking for someone to build my landing pages, already that's a red flag that you, you, you're gonna have to shift some things because in their mind, they already have the solution made up, right? And how many times do clients already have the right solution? 
a few, seldom. So when clients come with a solution already in their mind, that's a red flag. So you want to focus on the problem. What's the problem you're solving and who are you solving it for? So here's an example, a software company that is not getting enough qualified leads. That's the kicker there. And the next thing I want you to do after you, after you define that, I want you to define a logical process for solving that problem. And when you define that logical process, I want you to write it down in a way as if you were teaching me, as if you were teaching that person. You might say, OK, Mary, you're having some problems getting qualified leads. Let me tell you about the five phases you should go through to rectify that situation. So I want you to write that down. I want you to write down the three to five phases, your process, for how you would solve your common big problem for your who. Are you guys with me so far? Pretty, pretty easy, right? Here's an example of what that might look like. So let's say you're this uh, agency who is solving the uh, software companies not getting enough qualified leads. And if the question was, well, how do you go about doing that? You might say, well, first thing you have to do is you have to run an assessment. You have to understand what your opportunities are for qualified leads in the marketplace and understand what your opportunities are to drive those things and where are your gaps. Once you have a lay of the land, the next thing you need to do is you need to develop a strategy so you have a documented roadmap of what you're going to be doing over the next 12, 18, 24 months. Because without a plan, nobody can be on the same page, right? The next thing we would do is we would put a foundation in place so that way your digital marketing is shored up. Then we would run campaigns and then we would optimize. So this is a general example, but at a high level, this is the five phase process for generating more qualified leads for a software company. You guys follow me so far? So once you have that, I want you to, and you've heard a lot about this, I want you to productize each steps in that, each of those milestones in that process. Productize, what I mean by productize is, Give it a name, give it specific bullet points, give it a short description. I want you to write about it. I want you to document it as if it's literally, like Brad said, as if it's literally someone could pull out their credit card and buy. Does that make sense? I want you to do that with each of those five steps, or whatever it ends up being for you, three, five, seven, whatever it ends up being for you. I want you to give it a name, a short description, and a few bullet points of the value and what you're going to deliver. Does that make sense? So productize each steps in the, each of those steps in the process. And here's the cool thing. So Bo was talking about tripwires, uh, a couple of the other speakers were talking about tripwires. The really cool thing when you do this right is the very first step can be what I call your free tripwire, right, the assessment. Because guess what, we're, we're doing this anyway in the sales process, right? We're going through some sort of audit or assessment anyway with people. So you make this the first step in your sales process that you do for free. So now if somebody downloads a lead magnet on your website about not getting enough qualified leads and you follow up with them, you can say, Mary, I'm so excited you downloaded fill in the blank. I'd love to talk to you about how we can assess what your next steps are to start generating more qualified leads for your business. I have a bit of time on one of my strategist calendars that I can give away to do some consulting with you. Would that be of value to you? And so what you're doing is you're moving them into the assessment process. Right, so step one of your five phases is the first step in your sales process. Does that make sense? That's the thing you're going to do for free in sales. What this means is that you can no longer hire salespeople in your business that only crank out proposals. You actually have to hire people that understand what you do and can do a little bit of consulting. This will, I promise you this will dramatically change the effectiveness of your sales process when you hire people who can actually do some consulting in that process. So right now in my process, uh, my assessment and the step number two are 100% sales team produced. 100%. So we've got my salesperson, my main salesperson trained to where she can deliver steps one and two, 100% on her own, and deliver an amazing product, by the way. Because we've standardized it. We've given it a template internally. We've got bullet points on what we're supposed to be doing. And when she delivers that, she's blowing people's minds. So one of the keys is make it as much as possible to where it's sales team produced and generated, okay? And when you get those two lined up, some cool things happen. So let me give an example of how you can start to generate leads and, and follow up this way. It's what I call the blueprint formula. So the blueprint formula is essentially taking whatever blueprint you already have in your business to solve a problem. 
Uh, a great example would be um, the customer value journey, right? So that's like a blueprint level document. And what I want you to do is develop a lead magnet around it. And if you're a digital marketer certified partner, you can leverage this asset as this lead magnet. So that's one of the cool things. If you're a partner, you should start leveraging this. So develop a lead magnet around your blueprint. And then the next thing I want you to do is write an in-depth blog post or some sort of open content that goes very in-depth on how to do what that blueprint is teaching you how to do. Right? So teach it in narrative format or in video format, but it's got to be open. So then what you do is you have calls to action in that piece of content for people to download that. And so that creates what we call a missing link. Missing link meaning we've got an asset and I've got a narrative that tells you what the asset does. So that way the asset becomes kind of a, a content upgrade, if you will. Once those leads come in, you make a follow-up offer to have an expert review or walk them through the blueprint to give them specific ideas for their company. By the way, this is the assessment. This steps you right into step one of your process. The key to this, though, especially if people are inbounding on these lead magnets and this kind of content, the key is you're going to be following up via email, but you have to also call these people. If you're not calling your leads, especially content-driven leads, leads that convert on some piece of content, if you're not calling your leads, you're leaving a lot on the table. You've got to pick up the phone, and you've got to call these folks, and you've got to show them the love, right? You've got to really aggressively help them, as I like to say. And then at the end of the assessment, you close on your, your next thing, which is a small paid tripwire. In this case, it would be a plan or a strategy. And so do you guys mind if I role play this out? I think we have time. Is that OK with you guys? And so we, if I'm on the phone with you guys and we run through assessment, what's your name? Montina. Montina? Yeah. OK, so we're going to role play this out, all right? OK, so I've been on the phone with Montina, and I ran through the assessment. And I just dropped loads of value, right? Just tons of value. And Montina's blown away. And I know that. She always is. Uh, so we're on the phone. And I say, oh, here we go. Oh, this is, oh, this is lovely. I'm mic'd up. Montina, uh, you know, I, I feel really good about today's conversation. I feel if you follow the steps that we talked about to start driving more qualified leads for your organization, I think you're going to be pretty successful. What do you think? Let's do it. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah, it She's, sounds pretty good. Um, can you kind of walk me through maybe the first example in the phase? Yeah, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shorten this up. But essentially what I'm going to say is absolutely. And so I recap what we talk about. You know, uh, Montina, if you don't mind me suggesting, though, I think there's something else you should do if you, if you don't mind me suggesting. I don't Above mind. and beyond what we've covered today. Okay. What I think you should do is I think you should now turn these uh, talking points that we have from today's call. And I'll send you the notes, by the way, so you Thank know what you. to take action on. Uh, I think you need to document this into more of a formal inbound marketing plan. Because chances are you're going to have to sell this into your organization, right? Yes, and I'm not real sure about the inbound marketing right. that you're talking about. So Will I would you help highly recommend that. What's that? Will you help me with that? I can. Good. She's making my sales job easy, guys. So my close is normally, um, would you like my help with that? Yes. Yeah. And so oftentimes they don't just say yes, what they say is, yeah, what does that look like? Because at this point, they know, like, am I buying something right now? Mm -hmm. Right? But I say, would you like my help with that? What does that look like? Yeah, what does that look like? Great. Well, I've got this, I've got this great inbound marketing plan that I can do for you to help you achieve your goals. And what it's going to require of you, Montina, is just a couple of phone calls. We do this over a couple of hours, over a couple of phone calls. I'm going to come back and present it to you. And then um, if afterwards you're not happy with it, I'll refund you 100% of your money. And we do this in a very short period of time for a really low cost. And the reason I do it with the low cost and the guarantee is not because I'm looking to make a bunch of money on you, but I'm looking to start a relationship. And I know you really don't know me from beyond a couple of conversations we had. And so I want to make sure the value is all on your side and you literally have nothing to lose. How does that sound? Right. OK, she just bought. You guys heard her. Give her a round of applause, please, Montina. And I was still on the phone talking in there like that. I'm not sure why I was doing that. Um, so then that's when you're going to close on that next thing, right? That's your paid trip wire, right? And along the way, you're now selling your way, by the way, guys. Because how many times have we ever gotten off the phone with somebody and they, they told us, um, I have an RFP, I'm going to say, I want you to do a proposal for me. They start dictating the next steps, right? 
And, and for a while now, I learned I don't want that. They don't dictate the steps. I have a way that I do it that I know works. And I'm not going to put my destiny in their hands. Okay? So we sell on the next thing. And here's a little, uh, I don't like this word, but the, a little ninja trick for you. Is once Montina said yes and we set up the call, I say, oh, by the way, Montina, almost forgot to ask you. When I come back to do the presentation of your plan in a couple of weeks, would you also like to see a proposal from me on uh, executing the services that we recommend in the solution in the plan? Yes. Everybody says yes, by the way. I think I've had one person ever, ever, ever say no. The reason this is important is because a lot of times what people will do is they'll go do this plan, this strategy, this paid thing, and then afterwards they'll say, you want a proposal from us, and then guess what happens? They go dark, right? They take two weeks and two months to get back to you. So I pre-sell permission to give a proposal at the moment I sell the paid tripwire. But I only do that after they've said yes to it, and it's an oh, by the way. Does that make sense? So pre-sell the proposal. Get their permission that when I come back and present the plan to you, the strategy, or whatever your paid thing is, is it okay if I also give you a proposal to see what it would look like for us to execute on that plan? Are you guys with me so far? I'm probably going to wrap up early and give time for questions. Is that okay? All right. Um, then what you want to do is then when you go give the proposal, you want to show them that they are already two steps in to your process. They're already two steps in and they don't even know it, right? They're already two steps in. So I'm going to role play this out again, if that's OK. This is big. We do this a lot. If you're not doing role play with your sales teams, I highly recommend. We do this a lot at Elevator. OK, so let's role play this out. So I'm going to um, go back to Montina here. And uh, Montina, I'm really excited about the plan we just presented. Um, I'd like to now talk to you about what it would look like for Acme Corp to start uh, helping you with that plan. So at Acme Corp, the reason I think that uh, I won't need her to, need nah, nah. So why'd you say her? All right, fine. I'm going to be talking. Marcus, I'm going to be directing it to Vermont. Okay. All right. Okay, so at, uh, at Acme Corp, we have the Acme lead generation formula. And this is what we're going to recommend that we do with you. We're going to take you through a five-phase process of assessment, strategy, foundation, campaigns, and optimization. Now, for the purpose of time today, I'm going to shortcut the description of those things. Is that okay? Uh, we're going to take you through that. And it's really important to understand that um, through this methodology, we have lots of experience and lots of proven results, and that's why we're recommending it for you. In fact, we've taken 297 companies through this process to date. Companies like, and then you show your logos, right? And oh, by the way, that's not just us saying that. And when you look at John Smith of Notable Brand, he says, since working with Acme Agency and following their strategic guidance, Ramban leads have quadrupled in less than six months. They're truly experts in their field. And here's what happens as a result of, it's not just John, but our average is 594% increase in inbound leads after the first 90 days of launch. That's why I'm so confident that the plan that we just discussed, if we employ the Acme lead generation formula to your company, we're going to get results. And oh, by the way, Martina, you guys are already two steps into this process. Because you recall, we did the assessment, and we determined that you had some amazing opportunities. We just got finished with your strategy and presented this amazing strategy plan. The next step to continue working with Acme would be to consider having us build your foundation, and then possibly getting into uh, an ongoing relationship of campaigns and optimization. How does that sound? OK. So uh, anyways, that was my little role play, just so you guys can see how that plays out, how you can connect everything and connect the dots all along the way. If you do this right, if you use the digital marketer mantra of value in advance, if you're always helping and exceeding the cost, right? if every step exceeds the cost, and make no mistake, them getting on the phone with you is a cost of their time, but if your value always exceeds every step of the way, the next step will always be natural, and you will find they will ask for it. The next step will always be the next natural thing to do. And you will then move from trying to, trying to go from a lead to a proposal and trying to close that enormous gap. Okay? So I'm going to give you a few tips. Tip number one, standardize and document. Standardize your process. Even if you don't follow the process I recommended today, it can only benefit your agency if you start standardizing and documenting your sales process.
Because when you hire salespeople, if you want them to be successful, I don't care how much experience they have, they're going to have to come in and learn your way you do it. And they're going to have to come in and learn your company and your offerings. It can only help them if you have your process standardized and documented. At Elevator, we have about a 50-page document on how we sell at Elevator. It's the full entire playbook. When you come on board as a sales team member at Elevator, your first 13 weeks experience are fully defined out. That's how we ensure success. That's how we know we're going to bring good character people on who have some sales skills and turn them into rock stars. You want to build trust every step of the way. This goes back to what I said a moment ago. You have to give more value than their cost. And please, please, please do not skip steps. Again, you don't have to follow my process, but whatever process you define, start sticking to it. And do not skip your steps because you define them for a reason. And don't let the heat of the moment where you got this hot lead on the phone deter you from that. And just simply walk away from bad fits. If we say that our people are the product, well, the culture of your agency is greatly impacted by the clients you have on your roster. Right? Anybody ever have a bad client that just totally ruins the culture and the attitude in the office? I know we have. So walk away from bad fits. If they don't want to come along, and they don't want to come along your process, that's probably a clue that they're not going to listen to the direction of your project manager either, or your account manager. Right? And as long as you build that value uh, to where it, it more than exceeds what they're putting out and make it the next logical step, should be a no-brainer. And what I want you to do is start innovating the solution to the common target audience problem, not the individual problems of clients. So for example, if you sell to chiropractors, let's say, what are the problems chiropractors experience when it comes to driving more patients in the door? Solve that problem at large, not Bill's chiropractic shop down the street. Does that make sense? When you solve the common problem, you can then standardize and you can turn this into something that becomes much more efficient in eliminating chaos within your organization. Guys, that's all I have for you today. We're three minutes early. If you have questions, I'm available to answer questions. Yes? Can we get a mic? Oh. <laughs> Marcus just outed her for coughing in her. So right now I'm in the process of hiring a sales team. Any way we can get your 50-page document? The, <laughs> are you talking about my sales template. playbook? Yes. OK, so this really wasn't um, supposed to be a sales pitch up here. I am working with, addition, with agency owners. So I'm looking to coach 12 agency owners. I already have two now. I only have room for 10. If you're looking to work with somebody, just let me know. I don't have like a, a landing page to go to or anything like that. Just let me know and shoot me an email. But yes, that sales playbook is something that I am uh, including and selling with that kind of coaching program. So if you're interested, yes. But just giving it away, there's a lot of IP there. I, I probably won't just give it away. <laughs> you know, I have had uh, more people re uh, inquire about the beard, and I forgot to actually change this photo out, so I apologize. I have new professional photos that don't include the big beard. Why did I cut it? Uh, a little embarrassing, we've got time. Um, I'm a kind of a little bit of a high maintenance guy, and my beard, okay, since you asked, <laughs> since you asked, my beard grew funny, and I, it required a lot of maintenance to get the shape right, and I just was like, oh my God, I'm just, I, I'm done with this, so. That's why I shaped the beard. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of work. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, back there. We got a minute, 13 seconds. Hi, Frank. Um, my name is Vidal. Um, I want some practical advice in how to niche down in one specific niche. Uh, I, I saw that we serve like many types of services like website. Um, how to choose that niche? I know that you have to choose what the market wants and what you are good at. But also, if we have different things, how we, how we niche down practically? 
So I would go back to looking at your client list and figuring out who have you served well, who are you really good with, and where have you delivered the best outcomes? Not the best website design, right? Not the best, the, the prettiest ad or the best ad copy, but who have you generated the best outcomes for? And then find out if that marketplace, if that target audience, that niche values that outcome to the degree that they're willing to pay you for that outcome. So to me, you have to start with your who. Like who do you really resonate with and who can you deliver outcomes for reliably? And then the next thing you would do, if, after you go through some work to make sure that's your target audience, uh, is you would uh, develop your process for how you generate that outcome. So what I just talked about, those phases towards generating that outcome, what does that look like at your agency? Give it a name, be proud of it. Get everyone on your team rallied behind it. It could be the customer value journey. Whatever it is, you gotta, uh, you gotta really uh, document it and, and stick to it. But I would start with finding out who do you develop uh, outcomes for consistently and are they willing to pay for it? And do you enjoy working with them? And then less is more. Less services is more. I, I think you guys have heard that enough over the course of today so far. Time for one more question and then we're gonna call it quits. Anybody? Okay, guys, thank you for, oh, you got one? Yes. Oh, good, good question. So how do you overcome testimonials? So they're gonna want a referral to talk to somebody? Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. so here's the way I handle that. Um, I, most of the time don't get the request that they need to talk to somebody before signing, but sometimes I do. So here's what I say, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Client, I completely understand that you wanna talk to somebody to make sure, um, but because we get asked this question a lot, because I value my client's time, I'll tell you what, uh, you sign the contract, and I'll put a little uh, disclaimer in there, that you have seven business days or five business days to contact my referral sources. And if you don't like what you hear, we'll tear up the contract, nobody's feelings are hurt, we're done. But in order to do that, I gotta make sure you're ready to do business. So I do need you to sign. Once you sign, I'll get you this contact, and you have five days cooling off period to cancel out. Now I get that less, that works really well, by the way, and it's a power play and you're in control, but I will tell you I get that less and less because I follow this process because they never ask for referrals to buy an $800 or $1,500 marketing plan that you put 100% guarantee on. You make them offers they can't refuse because once they write you one check, the odds that they're going to write you another check go through the roof. My conversion on paid trip wire to core contract, six-figure contracts, 67% and they rarely ask to talk to anybody because of that process. I'm over time. If you guys want to talk to me, I'll be here today and tomorrow. Thanks for having me, guys. That was awesome.